Ford to, with a big piece to quench it directly to martensite, we have to quench it to a, a higher temperature form or softer form. Well, we, if we could quench it to martensite, that is, we could quench it into that area, then we could temper it by putting it in a furnace. We didn't have to do what the blacksmith did. <coughs> we could actually put it in a controlled temperature furnace and bring it back to a hardness level that we desired. And so we did that, and we did that time and time again. Well, what we need to know more than anything else at, at the moment is why does all of this work? H how does all of this work? I, th I thought that uh, perhaps before I really show you this, I ought to show you how easy it is to do the heat treatment. And you can do this, all you really need is a piece of material, which is steel, and let's say a bucket of water, and you say, I want to heat treat this material. Well, I have a piece of piano wire. And that's what we looked at before. And if I heat this up to a red heat, and that's not difficult to do, <coughs> if you have a match, um, I'll heat this up to a red heat. I can quench it, and you can uh, witness yourself the property change. It's, it's fabulous. Now, this particular piece of wire I have, which you, you have a hard time seeing, I'm sure, but if you could look very closely at this, at this piece of wire, you'd find that if I try to bend it, it, it resists the bending. It has a high modulus of resilience. This is a piece of patented wire. It's about as tough a wire as we can get. Piano wire has a very high tensile strength. I can actually bend it if I work real hard at it and get it to do that. But if I take this piece of wire and heat it up to a red heat in this flame, get it so I can hold it. If I heat it up to a red heat in the flame, and quench it in the water, and take it out of the water, and now if we, if we look closely at this again, if we, if we really inspect this, so we can see what's going to happen when I bend it, and we try to bend it, it just breaks in two. It's brittle, right? So that quickly, I made the material go from a paralytic structure to an austenitic structure, quenched it to a martensitic structure. It takes almost no time at all. Now we can do that again, and we quench it, and then we can temper it, or reheat it and make it soft again. So, again we'll heat the piece up and just quench it, and this time make martensite that we will transform. Okay, now, I think you will believe that that piece that I quenched is going to be very brittle, right? So I'm not going to break this piece, and rather than that, I'm going to heat it up just like you would anneal a piece of glass, right? And I'm going to warm it up so it goes up to uh, a temperature that's not red hot, but it will be up there rather close to that. And when I do it, I'll find out that I have softened the material, I've tempered the material, just like the blacksmith tempered it when he let it get hot again. Now, if I guessed right, because I have a hard time seeing the color here, then this particular material, still hot, still warm, should have picked up a ductility, should have become less hard. Well, let's see if I guessed right. And you see, now I could even tie it in a knot, right? Uh, I couldn't do that with the original piece of material. I couldn't do it with the Martin site. If I want to now, I can harden this knot, I can heat it up and quench it, and that knot will become like a piece of, of uh, glass again, very brittle. So I can go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and continue to do this process. Steel attains a solid solution phase called austenite at approximately 1700 degrees Fahrenheit. At room temperature, steel exists in a phase called ferrite. To increase hardness, steel is heated into the austenitic range and then quenched rapidly to form martensite. Pearlite consists of a layer of ferrite and a layer of cementite. 
When polished and etched, this material gives off an iridescence that resembles mother of pearl. Once steel has been quenched, it is very brittle. To recapture ductility, the steel is then tempered by reheating. As tempering temperature increases, room temperature hardness decreases. So, how does it all work? Well, it wasn't until in the 20s we really found out, and two people working for U.S. Steel actually, or I suppose that they were students at the time, but uh, Bain and Davenport came up with something called a TTT diagram. Now, in this particular diagram, <coughs> we see uh, the austenitizing temperature. We see the temperature that, that we wanted to uh, heat the material to, and that's the dotted line up the top here. If we heat the material above the, this particular temperature, that's 1,333 degrees, we get austenite. A big problem, you see, is can you quench the whole piece of material at one time? We just recited that you can't. The outside quenches first. So what we're really going to do now is make a real thin little piece of material, tiny little piece of material. So when we quench it, it all gets quenched at one time. Instead of quenching it in water, we'll quench it in molten tin. Tin has a boiling point of about 4,100 degrees Fahrenheit. So molten tin can exist up here very easily. So I'm going to quench it in zero time. Notice in the bottom now, I'm measuring time. So I'm taking the material from this particular point and quenching it, let's say, just to this point. And I hold it for a period of time, and then I quench it all the way down. And what Bain and Davenport found was they get martensite. If they held it for a longer period of time, they finally get to a point where they get martensite, it quenched it from here, but a little bit of coarse perlite. If they held it still further, they get in between these two curves and it'd say have half martensite and half perlite if they quenched it. And finally, if they got to a time period out here, it would be all perlite. And so what they found was that in isothermal transformation, they can cool the material rapidly to some temperature and get a product, in this case being coarse perlite. If they dropped it to a lower temperature, they would get a finer perlite, which would be a harder material. And that's like, say, quenching it in a heavy oil. Or if they dropped it to a still lower temperature, they would get a still finer material, which is now referred to as bainite, named after the man who developed the chart, of course. <coughs> and if you cooled it very, very rapidly down into here, and held it for a period of time, you could drop the temperature and it would change to martensite beginning at this temperature, they call the MS line, and terminating at this temperature, calling the martensite finish line. So now it's possible to take the material and quench it into this range, hold it till it became equilibrated from its thermal stresses, and now drop it into this temperature and turn it to martensite, and we won't have all of this drastic explosion that we would have had before. Not only that, we could have a material that's down here, instantly cooled from austenite down into this region, which would be not completely transformed. And if you had a razor blade, for instance, it was made out of that, that means it isn't going to be as hard as it would be if you put it in the deep freeze. If, if, if you had such a razor blade, then you put your razor blade in the deep freeze and you take it out, you would have dropped it lower in temperature and so you transformed all of the retained austenite into martensite, and it would be a harder blade, and you get more shaves out of it. I don't think your razor blades come to you that way these days, but nevertheless, uh, it, it describes the exercise very well. So this is called a time temperature transformation curve, or a TTT diagram, and it, in essence, is the thing that is ruling what we are doing with uh, the steel. Well, that's all well and good, but, but what really is going to happen now if uh, we go into industry and we want to control <coughs> this particular phenomena, we want to, say, order up a piece of steel that's hardened exactly to the hardness level we want. I mean, no guesswork. We want, we want to get it to exactly the temperature, that, uh, uh, the uh, level that we want. Well, if we do this, we are going to use a test. And in this test, we're going to have to appreciate 
that this is what would happen if we would have, let's say, a round bar of, say, SAE 1045 steel, and we quench that round bar. So the round bar is everything now that's between here and here. That's the round bar. And I'm interested in looking at the hardness radially across that bar, let's say at the midpoint of the bar. So I cut this cylindrical section half in two, and I'm going to do a Rockwell C hardness across this. I should be able to get a Rockwell C hardness of, of at a very high temperature for this particular material. And yet, uh, I, I won't really be able to do this in the very, very center of the bar. Uh, what, what I'm really examining here now is a 5-inch bar, a 4-inch bar, a 3-inch bar, a 2-inch bar, a 1-inch bar, and a half-inch bar. So it says if I took the 5-inch bar, I could get it up to a rock will see hardness on the outside of that level, but down on the inside, its hardness would be dropped way down. If I take a smaller bar, I could harden it to a rock will see hardness level almost through the entire bar. An intermediate size bar, let's say one that's like this, a bar that's that wide, then I would have a hardness distribution that looks like that. So I never can get the material hardened to the very center, exactly the hardness I want. So how are we going to describe this? Well, we could take a lot of cylindrical bars and keep on quenching them at different rates until we got exactly what we wanted and say, from this cylinder series, this particular piece of steel has a size that will harden exactly to the center. It would be called the ideal diameter of that steel. But we have to run many, many tests to do this. And in recent years, even in my time, <coughs> there was a man named Walter Jomini, who was at one time president of ASM, who developed a test. And this particular test is called a Jomini hardenability test. And it saves us oh so much time. And so we have to learn how to use it. And we use it a tank. And this particular tank is called a uh, Jomini hardenability tank. It's a very simple thing.